have a lot to talk about today, uh, just a week off from election day. And um, so I'm gonna get started, I'll just do some introductions and then we'll roll into our program. Uh, first, I wanna introduce myself, I'm Larry Jacobs. I'm a faculty at the University of Minnesota in the political science department and the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, which is uh, bringing you this program. I direct the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Humphrey School which is responsible for convening uh, this program. Um, and I wanna just mention, we are eager to get you involved. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. Please give us questions, give us good questions, challenging questions, we, or questions about things we haven't covered. Really appreciate that. I'm eager to uh, introduce to you our guest today, uh, Vin Weber, former member of Congress, um, from Minnesota, uh, two decade relationship with the Humphrey School, which we are grateful for. Vin is a great friend of the Humphrey School. Uh, he's now at the Mercury firm in Washington, DC. And Justin Bowen, who is on the other side, a democratic strategist. Vin is a Republican strategist. The things about these two um, folks that we uh, uh, appreciate and rely on is both of them are connected. They are connected into their party's networks, both here in Minnesota and around the country. So we're able to get a bird's eye view of what's going on and a glimpse of uh, what the strategists on the ground and the data are showing. So we're grateful uh, to have uh, both of them with us today. Thank you very much, Vin and uh, Justin. Larry, thank you for having us. Thanks, Larry, good to be with you again. Uh, let me start off with you, Vin. Um, can you uh, give us your take on where you think the presidential race is today? Um, all the conventional polling, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, it makes it very clear that the pres that uh, Senator Biden, Vice President Biden, has maintained a solid lead for months and months and months. Uh, if there's been any tightening of it in the last few weeks, it's pretty small. Uh, and, and he's clearly ahead. Now, when I said conventional polling, I mean all the public polls that we pay attention to. Um, there, the, the, there is a counter theory, and I emphasize it's a theory, that, that there is, that these polls are understating what they would call the hidden Trump vote, Trump voters who simply won't tell a pollster who they're for. Um, it's a minority theory, but it is a theory advanced by a couple of different polling firms, the Trafalgar Group, uh, the Investors Business Daily Polling and the Susquehanna Poll, all of which have the advantage of having been closer to being right four years ago than they are now. So that's if that theory is right, and I underline if, then the next thing I'd say is I do believe the Trump campaign has a superior ground organization to turn out the vote. Uh, that is normally an advantage that accrues to an incumbent president because he has four years to build that organization, doesn't have to worry about fighting it out in the primaries. And so every president running for re-election going back to Bill Clinton has had a big advantage in terms of organization. If the theory that there's a hidden Trump vote out there is correct, then that advantage will play substantially to the president's benefit. But, you know, us us conventional types tend to think that the polls are more right than wrong. And we actually have seen in terms of the early voting numbers um, and the new voter registration, that that door-to-door -door operation that the Trump organization has been running for months and months has produced more uh, new registrations of voters uh, than the Democratic side. Yeah, and, and historically, you know, we've always had a combination of male telephone and direct voter contact efforts to get the vote out. And we have always known that direct voter contact is more effective. So the fact that the, the president's campaign has put that together is meaningful, but you have to, it, you, we've never thought that those vote, get, get out the vote techniques could account for more than a couple percent difference in the, in the election. So that's why I say you've got to believe the theory that says the race is really closer than most of the polling says that it is in order to believe that that advantage is enough to make a difference for President Trump. Thank you. Uh, Justin Bowen, for years, the Republicans had this advantage with 
their 72 hour get out the vote operation and their early voting. And their strategy was, we're gonna get in as many votes in the bucket as we can before that three day rush. Um, it looks like the strategies have been reversed because the Democrats appear to really be uh, you know, taking advantage of mail-in ballots and early voting. And from the data we have, it appears that there are more uh, Democrats taking advantage of that than Republicans. Are you confident that the Democratic candidate, Joe Biden, has an advantage or that we may actually get a red wave on election day where there's a surge of uh, Republican votes that overtakes what the Democrats have been doing for the last couple of weeks or a month? Well, I mean, I think I think you always want to have uh, votes in the bank. So if you if you're if we've got an advantage in early votes, then those are voters that that Democratic uh, campaigns don't have to have to talk with between now and Election Day. And they can spend their time turning out voters that don't always uh, participate or only participate in presidential elections and, and talking to the swing voters. So, I mean, I think it's always to your advantage to to push votes in before the election uh, and, and encourage people to, to vote before the election. And also, um, you know, that, that uh, prevents any last minute uh, uh, destabilization, destabilizations in the race at, um, um, down the home stretch. But, but to get back to your kind of your earlier question uh, with Vin, like taking a step back at this point in the campaign, uh, the two most important things to any campaign are time and money. The candidates time and where they're spending money. And right now, the Biden-Harris campaign is on the offensive. They're in Arizona, they're in Texas, they're in North Carolina, they're in Florida. They're on TV in Texas now, in, in Dallas, uh, San Antonio, El Paso, uh, and, and uh, in Houston. And Trump is having to play defense. He's in, New, uh, he's in uh, Nebraska today. He's having to play in, in uh, places like uh, northern Minnesota, where there are a lot fewer votes. Uh, and, and uh, it, you know, it was all kind of a base strategy, uh, uh, apparently, when, when Democrats are on the offensive. So, uh, you know, to, to Vin's previous point about the theory that there's this hidden Trump vote, uh, they sure seem to be like they're playing defense than, than actually believing in the theory that they're trying to push. So, uh, Justin, um, Democrats are haunted by 2016. They were ahead. They were sure that Hillary Clinton was going to win. The celebration was already beginning the Javits Center in New York. Uh, and so you've got a lot of jumpy Democrats out there who might hear you and say, yeah, but, and um, you probably know Tom Bonnier, who's the head of the Democratic data firm, Target Smart. And yep. he recently gave a kind of a, a video uh, talk where he warned about more known unknowns than ever before because of the coronavirus, because of the change in the Democratic uh, strategy of not um, doing door to doors as extensively. And he lists a whole series of reasons why there should be caution. One is that we know so little about this current election circumstances. He said it's likely or possible that small variations in turnout projections based on our models could have substantial effects. He warns about this um, GOP uh, wave on election day of voters just swamping and, and really matching and overmatching Democrats in key states. He also warns about the pattern we saw in the primaries of a number of the Democratic mail-in ballots being faulty. And obviously a lot of um, you know, uh, lawsuits are gonna probably end up with Justice Barrett having a say in them, but a lot of them are gonna be about these so-called spoiled ballots um, does that make you nervous? Does all that uncertainty give you some grounds for pause that maybe this isn't going to go as you expected? Well, I mean, I, I think that those are all valid, valid points. And, and to be clear, the Biden campaign isn't, you know, taking the next uh, seven days off and calling this thing uh, a victory. They're, they're pushing the, the pedal uh, down. And that's why he's going to be campaigning in Wisconsin and Iowa. Um, you know, and so a couple of other factors, I think, that can help predict how the election is going to go. Enthusiasm. I mean, Democrats, the participation level by Democrats in early voting and in small dollar fundraising is unlike anything we've ever seen before. And so Democrats are fired up and, and, and engaged. Um, and, and I think that that's a big advantage that, that, that we have. There are certainly, most certainly unknowns and, and the Biden campaign started the direct voter contact much later than you normally see. 
in uh, in presidential years, but but they are um, you know there are going door to door in many states where COVID numbers aren't aren't so high and um, and and when they're able to follow uh, health guidelines. But the other thing is this race has been relatively stable for a long time, um, and uh, and the COVID numbers are getting worse, not better. That's Trump's biggest Achilles heel. Uh, the jobs numbers aren't improving at the level that that he likes. And again, I'll go back to just where they're campaigning. They're not reaching out uh, to uh, to Obama, Trump voters or swing voters. They're trying to still shore up their base, both in the rhetoric that the president's using and the places and parts of the states that he's going to where he's going. Yeah, I did notice that Donald Trump spent a full day in Pennsylvania hitting those areas where he did well in 2016. So. Um, and Biden is playing defense, or at least he's trying to uh, fight to, to win that state. And the polls have been mostly stable, but they've gone up and down a little bit. Vin, do you, when you look at the Republican and Democratic uh, voters, do they look comparably enthusiastic? Or do you think Republicans have an advantage in terms of that excitement for, for the president? I think that we have an advantage. I, I, I think... <clears throat> the Republicans have an advantage. I think Justin is right. There's a lot of enthusiasm on the Democratic side, but it's much more negative enthusiasm. It's enthusiasm for getting rid of Donald Trump, <clears throat> whereas the enthusiasm on the Republican side is for the president. And I think that helps back to the point we made earlier about motivating the organization uh, on election day itself and actually getting people out there. The, the, the crowds that people ridicule the crowds that the president gets a little bit and they criticize him because people aren't wearing masks and all that thing like that. On the other hand, he's getting huge crowds all the time. And you know, that's that's not nothing. And as we've talked about before, Larry, the Trump campaign for years has used these events not just to make the president feel good about people cheering for him, but to actually collect data on everybody that attends and start communicating with them. And uh, they've got a very sophisticated database communications network to contact everybody that's ever been to a Trump event. And I think that, it's, I think that it gives an edge in terms of enthusiasm. Now, oh, let me say, we're, they're projecting we may have 160 million votes. That indicates a lot of enthusiasm on both sides. I wouldn't want to overstate any advantage. But I think if there is one, it's a little bit on the Republican side. Usually, and maybe this is no longer the case, we talk about high turnout elections. The old, you know, kind of uh, rule of thumb was when when in turnout is higher, Democrats do better. Um, is that not right anymore? I, I don't think it's ever been absolutely right. I, I, I think it, it all depends on who turns out. You know, go back to when you know when when Reagan was elected. We wanted higher turnout because Reagan was turning out a lot of formerly Democratic voters that wanted to vote Republican. So it, it just depends entirely on who's turning out. When, when, when oh, there was always the theory, of course, that minority voters turned out in lower numbers and they tended to vote Democrats, so that was good. Well, minority voters turned out for President Obama in larger numbers than white voters did. So it, it just depends on who, who is voting. I, I do not think that low turnout elections necessarily favor the Republicans. I think that both parties need to get their votes out. And the country is relatively closely divided ideologically. So it depends on who turns their vote out. I mean, when you're hearing numbers coming out of Texas of, you know, potentially record numbers of votes. I've seen, you know, independent and Democrats saying, well, if we hit this number, it's going to be a Democratic win. You wouldn't necessarily buy that. It's it's it, you know, we don't know enough about that data. No, no, I, I, I don't buy it. I also don't discount it. I just think we don't know. I do, I do think, just to put in perspective for, for the listeners, so in 2016, we had about 137 million people participate. And to Vin's point, I mean, 538 is predicting somewhere between 145 and 165. So a massive increase in level of participation. Some of that has to do with there are more eligible voters now than there was four years ago, uh, some demographic changes. Another thing has to do with their uh, uh, you know, enthusiasm and voter registration by communities of color in higher numbers than there were four years ago. And some of the, um, uh, some of the laws on the felony disenfranchisement uh, have changed in some of these states as well. So it increased the likelihood of some of the people participating. And you know, the anecdotal stuff and, and the hard data that I've seen from these campaigns is that young people are, are registering and participating and the early vote numbers uh, continue to kind of show some strength for, for Joe Biden 
Um, and, you know, I, I, I do uh, concede the point to Vin that that the Trump uh, team has big rallies, but the Biden folks aren't trying to have rallies. They're trying to be safe and they're trying not to spread COVID. And, uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for Joe Biden and against Donald Trump and combine that together and, and the Democratic base is fired up. I think, the most, I think the most important variable, and Justin just talked about it, is young voters. If you talk about voters that perennially do not turn out and who are overwhelmingly in the polls supportive of Biden this time, it's young voters. If the turnout we're seeing reflects genuinely a significantly higher turnout by young voters, that's unquestionably a good thing for Biden. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that is like we've seen a shift in in, in vote by seniors, uh, at least in some of the polling now that are concerned about COVID, the response to COVID and are supporting Joe Biden in higher numbers than they supported Hillary Clinton in 2016 as well. And that's why places like Florida and Arizona are much more in play, uh, places that have higher number of, of retirees. And of course, there's the issue uh, about Hispanic turnout and votes. The polls have been kind of back and forth on that. Um, and there's questions about whether Joe Biden is going to be able to uh, reach the levels of Barack Obama or even Hillary Clinton, um, and that the president has been eating away, according to some of the analysts, at the Democratic advantage among Hispanics and Latinos, um, and even among African Americans. Then do you, do you think that's true when you look at yeah. Texas or Florida or, or some of the other key states? I do think it's true. I don't know what, how the magnitude of the increase that he's going to get may, may be more modest than he would like, but I do think it's true. And I think there's a reason why it's true. I mean, Republican candidates in the past have really not tried very hard to get actual minority votes. They have tried to position themselves to look good, mainly for moderate white voters who want them to look good with, uh, with uh, minority interests but they haven't really had a sophisticated effort to try to actually get minority votes. That's not true this time. The Trump campaign has really devoted resources to the Hispanic community and the African-American community, not just to get them nice photo ops, but to actually try to get minority votes. And I think that there are votes there to be had. Um, he is, he's identifying himself with working class people. Uh, and there are a lot of working class people in the minority communities who have the same interests as working class white folks when it comes to the economics and the other issues like that. So I think that he can, I think that he will increase his percentages in those communities. How much is hard to say. I think this there is- was this a, is There was the moment, just a second, Justin, there was a moment in the uh, debate last week where, or moment, moments, when uh, Donald Trump went after Joe Biden for supporting the, uh, the reforming of sentencing um, as hurting African-American males. Um, Joe Biden has now described that as a mistake, but that may be also another wedge into uh, the minority communities. Yes? Ben? Oh, well, I, th I think it is. I mean, I, th that issue has changed dramatically over the years. When, when Biden authored that bill in 1994, it was supported not just by the white community. It was supported mainly by, by, by the, the African-American community that was concerned about crime in their neighborhoods. So yeah, he, he says it's a mistake now. That's fine. And it's certainly in the, in the minority communities today, it's viewed as a seriously mistaken law. That reflects a change substantially in people's view of that law, looking at it in the rear view mirror. But it's, it's, it, 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 most people supported a tougher approach to crime at that, that particular point in our history, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, minorities or whites, that, that was the, the, the feeling in the mid 1990s that crime was a serious problem needed to be addressed with tougher sentencing and everything else like that. The country's gone through a sea change on that issue and an intellectual change on that issue. Um, but it probably hurts Biden somewhat to have to take, uh, take responsibility for that. He also switched his position on capital punishment. Joe, part, part, that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in this because, of course, Trump is a supporter of capital punishment, but Biden was a, a proponent of capital punishment. He has shifted on that issue as well. That shows, again, in my view, more how the country is changing than how individual politicians are changing. Uh, Justin, uh, uh, how do you size up the, the strength of 
uh, Biden among uh, communities of color? Well, I think that you know all the polling has shown that he's that he's doing incredibly well. Uh, but I think the the uh, other advantage he has is Barack and Michelle Obama, and you're going to see the two of them spend a lot of time in Florida uh, and in Pennsylvania and in Michigan over the next few days. Uh, you know, you talked about putting kind of that 2008-2012 Obama coalition back together. Uh, I think that he's going to spend uh, a great deal of time traveling to those three states, as well as Michelle, and 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 showing um, uh, showing them why um, folks in that community why they're why they're supporting Joe Biden, why he's the right choice for president. And I think you're gonna you're gonna see more enthusiasm as those in, in the final days as, as they're out on the trail. Um, then uh, I remember back in uh, 1980 election with uh, and people don't remember this, but the race between Carter and Reagan was very close. It was really the last 10 days when it shifted in Reagan's advantage. Um, and one of the things that hurt uh, President Carter was that the hostage crisis was on the news 24 seven. One of the networks, and that was a time when networks dominated the news. Uh, they had a special show, just counting the number of days that American hostages were held in yeah, Iran. Ted Koppel, if I remember right. Yeah, exactly. And so the question then was having that bad news for Carter uh, out there in people's minds, the front of their minds as they're voting, uh, hurt him. So let's come to 2020, in which it's hard to open a newspaper and not see you know, the coronavirus. Um, and in yesterday's paper, you've got the president just sick and tired of all the news about COVID, 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 as he said. Meanwhile, you've got his chief of staff, who's apparently not getting the White House memos, who has said on Sunday, we're not going to control the pandemic, which I guess led to a guffaw in the White House and with Trump of, come on, we've got to, we've got to respond to this. Does the president have a significant disadvantage? Not only is he not trusted on that issue, but the news focus on the coronavirus and that 24-7 cycle it's just killing him, isn't it? Yeah, it, there's no question about it. That And Biden is correctly, from a strategic standpoint, basically trying to make that the only issue in the campaign. That's why he's reluctant to commit himself on other things like court packing that ought to be legitimate issues, because he understands that to the extent that COVID is the issue, it really hurts the president badly. There's only two questions about that, and I'll go back to your 1980 reference, Larry. First of all, Sometimes people conclude that the government can't do anything about a problem. Uh, the big issue in the late 1970s was inflation. You, every poll we saw and then going up to 1980 said that inflation was the biggest concern on the public's mind. But they also said the public did not believe that it mattered who they elected to deal with that problem. They cared about taxes and things like that that they thought the government could actually do something about. So that that's one question, does, does the public think that it will matter in terms of uh, approaching the COVID crisis, who they elect. And the second thing, back to 1980, it's a very simple. You know, Reagan simply had to establish that he was a responsible and acceptable alternative to a president that they wanted to get rid of. And he did that. And when, it, when by the time he achieved that, some people say it was because of his debate performance, probably that and other things. It, it, it just it just sort of collapsed on Carter, and and that's still Biden seems to have have withstood most of Trump's attacks, but there's still a few days to go, and he's made I think he made a mistake on energy policy in the last debate that's hurting him. I don't know that he's made a disqualifying mistake yet, but it's a, it's it's a similar situation a little bit with Reagan in 1980. If the public gets comfortable with him, and as I said, if the public thinks that the government can really do something about the biggest problem they've identified, that's all good news for Biden. Justin, was that a mistake by Joe Biden at the end of the debate to mention that he supported a transition from oil or was that kind of calculated to park that, you know, towards the end of the debate as a way to charge up uh, voters who are most intense about climate change? Yeah, I don't know if it was a calculation or if it was, uh, 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 planned out the way it was. I mean, I think that vice president answered the question, honestly, that, you know, the country needs to be looking towards an energy future. 
and everyone understands that there's going to be a long bridge to that uh, energy, uh, um, you know, the lack of fossil fuels or elimination of fossil fuels eventually. Um, um, but but um, he was answering the question honestly, which was kind of a, a breath of fresh air uh, from listening to President Trump on the debate stage. And like the climate change issue, Democrats and Republicans, uh, uh, is, is, if you look at young voters, that is something that people really care about. Um, and it's not just a it is not just a uh, kind of a Republican only issue now. We've seen the numbers move uh, strongly in the direction that we need to be considering, you know, what, what we're doing to the climate. Do you worry though that the um, talk about transitioning from fossil fuels could tip some of those competitive uh, votes in Pennsylvania, Florida, you know, some other states? I mean, there's a risk to it. Honestly, uh, let's, let's give them a, a grade for that. but. You know, this is a presidential I, election with high stakes. I, I don't. I don't. If people are if people are making their decisions based on who's the best for the fossil fuel industry, then Donald Trump's their choice. Okay, that's pretty candid. Well, it, but, okay, I, I've got to disagree. I, maybe if that's the way that he frames it, who's best for the fossil fuel industry? Uh, you're right. There's not there, that'll help with with uh, oil workers in in Western Pennsylvania and Texas. But the real question, and you talk about the transition, which I think there's going to be a transition, how fast and how sharp and how fast do we push up the price of gas that everybody pays, not just oil workers? $6 gas, uh, that's not going to do any good for the resorters in northern Minnesota that count on people coming up from the Twin Cities. Phasing out the internal combustion engine, thus ending the market for ethanol 100%, that's not going to be good for farmers in southern Minnesota. So there's a lot more to this than simply saying, yeah, we're going to be honest about it. We have to make a transition. How fast and how, uh, how much does the government push well, it? Not from a standpoint of energy workers, but of energy consumers. Well, I think the Biden campaign would gladly have a conversation about, uh, about ethanol and, and the ethanol industry and what the Trump administration has done with their waivers vis-a-vis -vis what the Biden administration would do for farmers in the Midwest. And, and I think that he's been, you know, it's not going to happen during a Biden administration. It's a long runway. And uh, and you know it's gonna it's gonna take some time, uh, but but to be honest with people that we we have a transition is a good thing I think. Okay, let me I'll move to a different topic. Uh, Vin, we've been talking about potential paths for for Donald Trump. A few days left. I think I'm sensing from you that you're you're not terribly optimistic. There's much uh, hope of that. But let me mention one issue. Um, I'm surprised it hasn't gotten any attention. In a few days, the government's going to release a record number for the economic growth from the second to the third quarter. It's known as the gross domestic product or GDP number. It's going to be an extraordinary number. It will get headlines because it's such an eye opener. Um, and there are different interpretations of what that means or doesn't mean. Do you think that's a moment for Donald Trump to get a bump uh, heading? It's just five days before Election Day to get that bump that he needs? Sure. I mean, I, the only mistake he's making is he's talking about 35% increase in GDP. So if we get 25%, people are going to say we fell short of his mark. 25% would be an historic, enormous response. And what he's basically saying is the economy is in the process of recovering from the greatest slowdown since the Great Depression. And I think that's good news. And I think he does, even presidents get credit for what goes on when they're in office. He certainly is getting the blame for COVID. He's, he, he will deserve credit for an increase in economic activity. Uh, and especially if he, he can project it out into the next calendar year, that we can pa get past the economic consequences of COVID. I think it's, I think it's a plus for him. And he, he needs to be talking about a lot and ready to take credit for it. And do you think he can be disciplined enough to actually just f focus on that one message you know, for let's say two or three days rather than going off on all these other tangents? I don't know that. I mean, he's, his, his messaging since the last debate has been pretty good. I haven't watched everything that he's done, but I've watched a little bit of it. He's, he's opportunistic in the sense that he saw the energy issue develop for him in the debate and he jumped on that and he's talked a lot about that. I'm sure that he will talk a lot about the economy on the day that it comes out. He's Previewing, previewing it a little bit now. Um, but uh, the other side of it is, at least until now, 
He's lost much of his margin on the economic issue. He used to have a big, big margin in terms of the question of who would best handle the economy. Now that margin is largely evaporated and he's got a very tiny margin on it. So he, he has to actually, as opposed to taking advantage of, an, of something that was working in his favor, he now has to recreate that advantage. And that's harder and there's not much time. Justin, do you think voters are going to look at that gain and say, oh, this is confirmation um, for, for Donald Trump? And I mean the up for grab voters <laughs> who've got plus 90 percent of each party's supporters, they're in the bag. But for that small number that are up for grabs, do you think those voters are looking at that gain or the loss, the kind of fact that they see such large joblessness, they see small businesses going under? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that they'll have to kind of look at the totality of of, of the argument over the course of the the campaign, not just one number, uh, uh, you know, at the end. And and I think folks know that uh, the reason there's been such great gains is we had such a you had to to shut the economy down in many states to 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 try to prevent the spread of COVID. And and have, had that been started earlier and handled differently, there may not have been the kind of losses that we we've seen in the president. Is responsible for for all all of his policies, not just the um, you know the economic numbers right at the end. So I think that I think that people are gonna we'll, we'll look at it in in, in its uh, totality. And I also wonder you know in this climate in this in this uh, uh, cycle where kind of every fifteen minutes the topic changes, how long something like that will resonate before we're on to something else? Justin, um, in past elections such as twenty sixteen the proportion of in polls of, of, um, of these kind of horse race polls where people were saying, I don't know yet, or they were supporting a third party candidate. And often that, that support melts away as you get closer to the ballot box. That was about 10 to 15% in 2016. It's been higher in the past even. And now it looks to be kind of in the five to 10% range, about, about half of what it was. Is that your read? Do you see the kind of up for grab voters to be quite, quite small um, and, and most voters kind of locked in on their candidate? Yeah, that, that's what we've seen. I think that's because people know Donald Trump and they know Joe Biden. I mean, we've got two candidates that have been around for a long time. Joe Biden in public office, president, obviously, for the last four years as president and then, and then in kind of the, the culture uh, at large. And so people, people are, you know, kind of know what they're getting. And there's not the 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 type of uh, the level of kind of voter education that you might have to see in some of these uh, these other races. So that makes that makes sense to me. And and then, if it's true that there's only you know, you know maybe seven percent or so of the electorate that's up for grabs, does that make it even harder for the president to do a comeback because you know it's there's just few votes around to to actually win over. Sure. I mean, the, the, we've throughout all of this, you know, the, the craziness of 2020, as we've talked about in this this program, <clears throat> the president's approval rating hasn't changed very much. It, it drops down every now and then, but I basically peg it at around 45% of the people had at one time or another have said they approve of the president. And presidential voting usually is pretty well pegged to the president's approval rating. Um, you can win with the minority of the vote, but you probably can't win with 45% of the vote. So he's got to pick up either a bunch of those undecideds who, as you point out, are very low in number, or do the much harder job of trying to convince a handful of Biden voters to switch to him, which is very, very difficult to do. So yeah, it's the, the, he'd, 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 he'd like to have a much bigger pool to fish in, but the, he is, he's got what he's got. Then we've got a question here from Chris Moen. He said, the silent Trump voter idea is all well and good, but what about the disaffected Republican voters? Well, there are certainly some of them, although the polls indicate not very much. The president's got a very strong base in the Republican Party, 90 plus percent. Uh, Biden has a strong base in the Democratic Party, too. It's mainly anti-Trump, but the president has a very strong base. Also, I would say that a difference is I don't think those disaffected Republican voters are silent about it. They seem pretty vocal. Uh, what we're talking about with the Trump, the theory of the Trump, the silent Trump voter is there are people that don't want their neighbors to know that they're voting for Trump. And again, I said it's a theory. I don't know if it holds water or not, but I don't think it's I don't think it's a parallel case 
to disaffected Republicans who have been quite vocal, although small in number. Dustin, do you agree with that? Um, I think I think that that probably is right. I mean, you know, to Vince's point, you know, the Lincoln Project, we don't need to go any further than the Lincoln Project to see disaffected Republicans and, and their uh, their level of, of making noise and uh, participation in the cycle. And so I think we've, I think that we've, uh, we, we've got um, Republicans that have decided that they've had enough, the never Trumpers that have always been around. And I think that group has gotten bigger. But, but it, I mean, statistically, there's the, you know, the Lincoln Project, which is great fun for Democrats sure. to watch. But when you look at the polling data, it still looks, you know, well more than 90% of Republicans, or at least those saying the Republican or supporting the president. Isn't that right? I think, I think what we've probably seen is a shift away from people that identify themselves as Republicans and identify themselves as independents. Um, I think that's why places like the third congressional district in Minnesota is now so solidly blue uh, when it was been a Republican, you know, kind of a, a, a Republican uh, slash independent district for so long. So I think that's, that's probably a yeah. shift, but the people that identify themselves as Republicans now are with the president. Yeah, they're like the they're like the Reagan Democrats. Who the only problem with that phrase is they weren't Democrats anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, got a couple of questions here, including one from Emil Quast about electoral college. We're talking about the popular vote. Justin, are you worried about the electoral college? Maybe Joe Biden wins popular vote like Hillary Clinton and loses electoral college. Uh, well, I think almost certainly Joe Biden is going to win the popular vote um, and by a bigger margin, uh, very likely than than Secretary Clinton did. Um, but this, you know, that that's great, but it doesn't matter for the for the purposes of the presidency. And so that's why, I, you know, I'm glad that there's much more polling on the state by state level this cycle than we've seen previous. We've got more data, obviously, on the early votes as well. And, and so I think that, um, uh, you know, I guess I'm worried about that, but but at the end of the day, what matters is winning in these states and 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 getting over 270, so. Justin, you're a data hound, I'm a data hound. And I wanna ask you a data hound question, which is in 2016, one of the signs that Hillary Clinton was in trouble was that the, the district polling in congressional districts was not matching up with the state polling. Mm -hmm. We were seeing democratic areas, districts that were you know, supporting Republicans and trending Republican, even as the state numbers seem to show that Hillary Clinton uh, had a lead. Is there a match or a mismatch this year as far as you've seen between what we're seeing in the state polls and what's going on within the state in the districts? Um, I think we've one of the one of the other challenges we've got in the district polls is there's just not as many of them. I mean, there's lots of state polls. You may get one or two or three public polls over the course of an entire election cycle in a congressional district, even if it's a contested congressional district. And so it's, it's, it's more difficult to kind of match those up. Um, and, and often uh, times the, the uh, groups polling, you know, all polls aren't equal, right? So the, whether, it's a, a, whether it's a live phone poll versus an online poll, there's lots of variations. And so it, it, it's tough to do, the, to do the apples to apples on that, um, you know, the people I talk to that know a lot more about this than me seem to think that they've that 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 there's a pretty good alignment from what they're seeing at a, at a congressional level and the statewide level uh, this cycle. But but you know, again, these are always just a snap and a snap in time, and and um, and there's plenty of plenty of, of time to go too. Um, Vin, we've got a question here from Rich Lusky. Uh, what do you think about um, the recent Supreme Court decisions about allowing late uh, absentee votes, about not allowing, excuse me, late absentee votes in Wisconsin, and really what is probably going to be two or three other cases coming to the court that's now going to be at full capacity with, with Justice Barrett? Do you think the Supreme Court is going to be taking a, a line that's favorable to Republicans across the board? No, uh, I, I, I hope that that's not what happens. I think there's a difficulty because the states do control the vote and, and the Supreme Court should not get involved in trying to prevent that from happening. Um, so I, I, I do think that there is, is a problem with all the mail-in voting we're talking about. And it's not the problem that the president has identified. I, I don't believe 
the notion that there's a large amount of voter fraud going to take place. I think that's not true. I think the problem is conducting an all-male election, if you haven't done it before, is a more difficult thing. And people are going to make mistakes. And, the, and it's going to have to go into the courts to adjust for some of those mistakes that are made on. And that, that's too bad. We don't want courts deciding our elections. Justin, uh, we've got a couple of questions here about Kamala Harris. And you and I had conversations during the summer, actually all three of us, uh, before the convention. And we were just, we were speculating about what impact Kamala Harris would have on the race. I would say the standard view, at least among uh, my set, political scientists, is that vice presidents rarely have an impact on a presidential election because of the attention on the, the headliners. Do you see Kamala Harris having a kind of an impact on this race that is going to change the outcome? Well, I mean, I, I think your your general premise is right. People don't vote for the vice president; they vote for the president. Um, you know, her job was to to show on the debate stage that she could be president. I think she she got over that hurdle and did a good job there. Uh, and I also think that she you know she fires up uh, base Democratic voters, and and you've seen that in the places that she's been. So I think that you know she's a, she is a uh, she's a great uh, balance uh, for for the vice president and an enthusiastic campaigner, um, and um, and she's um, I think she's been been just great for the for the ticket. Uh, but at the end of the day, people are voting for Joe Biden and uh, and or uh, uh, President Trump. Um, Vid Weber, we're going to move on to the U.S. Senate and the Minnesota State House races. But before we do, I want to ask you a question that's come up uh, with some of the folks uh, following. Uh, following us right now, what kind of if if um, President Trump were to lose, which is what you're anticipating, how do you think it, his loss is going to be presented by himself? Is it going to be a kind of John McCain or Walter Mondale concession, or are we going to see something, you know, Trumpian? I think we'll. <laughs> I think we're going to see something Trumpian. Right? Whether he wins or loses, it's going to be Trumpian. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't I, I don't buy the notion that, you know, they're going to have to drag him out of the White House but with an armed force. But I don't think that he's likely to go graciously either. I think he'll talk. I mean, he's set the stage. He'll talk about voter fraud. He'll talk about the media, which is justified, in my view. I think the media has gone over the top against him. But it's not that's not going to be the cause of the loss of the election if indeed that happens. Um, so I, you know, I think I think that he will not go quietly, but he'll go. And and the, the notion that we're going to have a constitutional crisis, unless it is an extremely close election, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to happen. Justin, let me uh, start with you on the U.S. Senate. How do you see the right now? The uh, Republicans have a three-vote um, majority, and the Democrats would need to gain then for uh, four votes net. Uh, if Joe Biden doesn't win to take the majority in the Senate, or three votes net uh, if uh, Joe Biden wins and therefore Kamala Harris becomes a tie-breaking vote. I keep using the word net because the Democrats will lose seats, most likely in Alabama, where Doug Jones has been renting that seat. Um, it looks as if the Republican will win probably handily. But Justin, could you give us your read on what the, state, the, the kind of state of play is in yeah. the U.S. Senate. Yeah. So, you know, similarly to, to the, the Biden kind of battleground state and playing offensive uh, uh, um, strategy, I mean, we've got one contested uh, Democratic Senate seat that, that is kind of, uh, that's lean Republican and it's the hardest one, which is Alabama and Doug Jones. Uh, and, and after that, we're either ahead in or tied in uh, between eight and 10 other polls. Um, you know, Arizona, uh, Mark Kelly is going to win in Arizona. Uh, Governor Hickenlooper is going to win in Colorado. Um, we're either ahead or tied in Iowa with Joni Ernst race down there. I, th I think there's some more polling coming out tonight that's going to show uh, uh, show Ernst behind. Biden's going to be there on Friday. Uh, Susan, the Susan Collins race in Maine. Um, you know, Gideon has been ahead by a few points consistently. Some more than that uh, in almost every poll. We've got a tight race in, in North Carolina with Tillis and Cal Cunningham uh, and, and then Bullock in, in Montana uh, is either a couple points down or a couple points ahead. 
Uh, and so we're playing offense on all those in all those states. And that doesn't include South Carolina, where where uh, uh, Lindsey Graham is is in a, a shockingly close race with Jamie Harrison raising you know almost sixty million dollars last quarter and and uh, the campaign he's running. And then we've got two Georgia uh, uh, elections that um, if if neither of the candidates can get over fifty percent plus one, we'll see a runoff in January. Uh, two Republican seats there as well. And so. Uh, you know, I'd much rather be in our position than theirs. We're playing offense all over the all over the country, um, and um, so I think that the I think that's a good this is a good position for Democrats to be in the final week. Finn, do you agree? Not not entirely. I think I, I probably would have agreed entirely about a month or two months ago, and I do agree with the first the first three seats that Justin and Democrats talking about: uh, Arizona, Colorado, and Maine. Now, those are all competent Republican candidates, but they're definitely behind and they've been behind for a long time. And the dynamics of those states don't seem to be helping Republicans this time around. So I think I probably would agree that those are going to be won by the Democrats. I don't concede any of the other seats you're talking about, though. I think that Danes has now pulled ahead in Montana. Uh, and he's got up against the governor, who's a formidable, formidable opponent. Um, but in that state, Trump ought to help him somewhat. I think he'll win. Lindsey Graham has indeed got a fight on his hands, and the money that's pouring in on the Democratic side is substantial. But the pull of the Republicans in South Carolina is pretty strong, and I don't think he's going to lose. We'll see about North Carolina. Um, it's hard for me to believe that the scandal around Cunningham is going to be disregarded by people of North Carolina, especially since he ran on a, has been running on a program of character. Um, We'll see. I, I would guess that Tillis will still be able to, to pull that out. And I would not discount yet the possibility that the Michigan race is going to be a competitive race. Um, John James, the Republican candidate, is an outstanding candidate, maybe one of the best we've got in the country. That He, he has bounced up to about even from time to time and then fallen back by a few points. That could still well be a competitive race in Michigan. So I, I think it's the control of the Senate is going to be decided by a seat or two at the most. Yeah. So I think I read Justin to be saying pretty much that he put a, a friendlier spin on it, but he's saying here are three seats Democrats will probably get, and then it's going to be a battle everywhere else. Both parties are, are fighting hard. Um, let me ask you about. Um, you know, we also, Larry, we, we also, as we've talked about in the past, increasingly in recent years, these Senate seats flop the way that the president votes. And so how, to, to Joni Ernst in, in Iowa, I, I, I've looked at that polling and Justin's right about it, but if Trump ends, ends up pulling Iowa out, he, it could well be that he makes the difference for Senator Ernst, and that is true in, in other states as well. My colleague, um, Daniel Hopkins, has written a terrific book on the nationalization of our elections with polarization sorting so many voters in the one party or another, and the fact that the news coverage of state and local elections has really plummeted. Our focus tends to be on the national race. And if it tips one way, we're just seeing more often than not a strong uh, tilt down ballot. Um, uh, and so, yes, I agree with you. Iowa could be one of those seats. Really interesting race uh, in Georgia. Um, there are two, um, and there's one in which uh, Raphael uh, Warwick is running. He is the pastor uh, at Ebenezer Church, where Dr. King was the pastor, and he's doing quite well. The, hit, the, the footnote there, though, is he won't get a majority, therefore there'll be a runoff election, which is Georgia law, and there's always an issue there about the Republican um, candidates consolidating and then beating um, the Democrats, I'm not sure this year. Justin, do you have a read on that Georgia race? Uh, I think that I think that your, your analysis is right. We're gonna we're gonna go to a runoff, uh, and it may be a runoff, and there may be two runoffs in Georgia that that will decide the U.S. Senate, and they'll be very expensive, and there'll be a lot of uh, there'll be lots of ads and lots of activity down there. Um, so you know, I, I think that we're gonna have to wait wait and see. I mean, we've got a fired up, obviously a fired up uh, a base uh, down there this cycle after what happened four years ago or two years ago, rather, uh, in the Stacey Abrams race. African-American community is uh, registering and turning out in, in record numbers. I mean, but taking a step back, just to, speaking about the Senate, just to look at where we're at, 
We're talking about Democrats winning in Arizona, Montana, North Carolina, Iowa, maybe South Carolina. Like this is where we're at. This was not. You're, you're talking about that. <laughs> well, they're either they're either ahead or in the margin of error in these places, or down a couple points. Okay, and we'll check. So these are competitive Senate races, and this was supposed to be the cycle. The Republicans were going to hold the Senate. And Democrats are clearly at, at an advantage right now heading into the election day. Okay, we got we got your read on that. Let's an come interesting back. Point, interesting point about Georgia. If we go to two runoffs in Georgia, the advantage in those races will go to whichever party loses the White House. Probably. Because it'll be, in essence, the first midterm election, and midterms are not good for the party that wins the presidency. Um, let me jump into Minnesota uh, and the U.S. Senate race between Jason Lewis, who unfortunately had emergency surgery, and we're thankful that he appears to be recovering well. Um, and he's up against the incumbent, Tina Smith, the Democrat. Uh, last week, we had a poll by Survey USA, which um, Nate Silver uh, grades it out as an A, so it's well regarded. Um, and the Survey USA poll had Tina Smith up only a point. And I would note that a few weeks earlier, Survey USA had Tina Smith up by 11. And then back, excuse me, had, me, had her up by seven. Back in September, Survey USA poll had her up by 11. So 11, seven, one. Justin, is that legitimate, those results? Do you think Tina Smith may have some softness there? Well, I haven't dug into the crosstabs of the Survey USA poll. And, you know, the one thing I saw in that is that they had, I think, a 12% undecided number, which we talked about earlier, I think feels high to me. Uh, and I don't know how they how they figured with the actual, you know, 1.3 million Minnesotans that have already voted and how that was figured into the mm -hmm. into the calculus. Uh, it, it feels different on the ground. It feels like uh, Tina is running either ahead of or very close to Joe Biden. Um, you know, she's been running now for three plus years. She's been on TV and been campaigning. Uh, and so Minnesotans, I think, know her. Um, and, uh, you know, she's been an effective legislator and, um, and worked across the aisle. She's, she's on the Ag Committee, which is important to folks, obviously, in all of Minnesota, but in particular in, in greater Minnesota. And so it doesn't, doesn't feel right uh, that it's that close, um, it, you know, as far as I can see on the ground. Now, it's good for Tina's fundraising and it's good to fire up the base and turn people out. So, so uh, I'm sure they'll take advantage of that. Vin, do you think uh, Jason Lewis has a shot here or is this just bad polling? Uh, no, I, I do think he's got a shot, and I uh, partially because it's what you said. It's, it's a respectable poll. The tracking on the presidential race has also, so, also showed a narrowing in Minnesota in the last three polls, although they still show the president behind by six points. I, I, I tried to look at the crosstabs to the extent that I could, although I'm, I'm kind of pulling this out of my hat. If I, one thing that I think I saw was that uh, Jason was doing significantly better than the president in the suburbs. Uh, and if that's the case, and if I'm remembering that correctly, it kind of bears out his strategy of trying to talk a lot about the violence in the Twin Cities and make that an issue in suburban areas that should be concerned about it. If that's the case, then this is, it's not just a fluke or a bad poll. It's a strategy that is actually working on Jason's behalf. And uh, I think that that's a at least substantially possible. Let me uh, talk about the congressional races in Minnesota. We've got very close races in Congressional District 1, which is in the South, Hagedorn and Feehan, who's the Democrat. And that race was one of the closest uh, in, the, um, in the 2018 election that Hagedorn won. Then up in the Northwest corner, you've got the long-term incumbent, Colin Peterson, who used to win overwhelmingly apparently in a close race against uh, Senator Michelle Fishbach. Um, Vin, how do you look at those races and, and how do you handicap them? Well, I, uh, first, uh, full disclosure, uh, years ago, Michelle worked for me and I'm, I, I like her a lot and I know her well. I also like Colin Peterson and know him well. I think that that district is moving substantially in the Republican direction. And I think Michelle is going to win. She's an excellent candidate former president of Minnesota State Senate, former lieutenant governor. Uh, she, I think that she will win that election, which is sort of fulfilling the movement of that part of the state to the Republican Party. The first district, I think, is basically a toss-up. Uh, Jim Hagedorn has uh, suffered a couple of uh, unforced errors. Um, I think that 
that race is going to be determined by how strong the president is in that district. Uh, the president should carry that district, although he's not as strong in southern Minnesota as he is in northern and western Minnesota. Um, but I think that Hagedorn needs some help from the top of the ticket. Justin? Um, so I think the uh, the seventh is is absolutely close. So Colin won up there by 4% uh, in 2018. Um, every two years we hear Republicans are going to be Colin Peterson uh, every year he wins. Uh, I've, you know, the polling I've seen, internal polling I've seen on the district, Biden's running about 10 points better than Hillary Clinton did up there, which, which should help Colin. He's the chair of the Ag Committee. He knows Red River Valley better than anybody. I think that that uh, matters to people up there. And I think there are going to be a lot of uh, Peterson Trump voters again this cycle up there. Um, and then the first, I, you know, I agree with Ben. I think it's going to be, it's that's super close. Uh, you know, the Hagedorn, uh, you know, kind of every few days seems like a bad story out of the, out of the district there. You got Dan Fian, who was a great candidate, ran a very close race last time. Army Ranger teacher. Um, uh, I think Dan wins. I also think Biden wins the first. And let me just get to the state house because a lot of these folks we know, they live here in Minnesota and they're, they're kind of in our circles um, and they're very earnest about the elections. Um, but Vin, how much uh, do they, how much do the, the house, which is currently controlled by the DFL and the Senate, which is currently controlled by the Senate with three seats majority, how much do they control their own destiny? Less than they think. Uh, it, it, we've got good candidates all over, both parties running hard, working hard, raising money, taking polls, and they don't want to, it's, it's a hard reality that a lot of them are dependent on how the president does, how the Senate race goes, maybe even how the congressional race goes. And that pull down ticket provides a lot of surprises on election day to the, to the dismay often or the elation of the candidate that benefits or is damaged by it. So they're not entirely uh, in control of their own destiny. I do think this time the, the race for the state Senate is the most important one because the Republicans control that. Um, and I think that they will, can, I think they're gonna maintain control of the state Senate. First of all, we have an excellent leader in Paul Gazelka, really one of the best we've had in, in, in the Republican party. And more concretely, they're raising a lot of money. Republicans have had a disadvantage in fundraising toward the vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats, largely because of the great success of the uh, Alliance for a Better Minnesota, which has done a really good job raising money for Democrats. The Senate Victory Fund is raising a lot of money this time around for Republicans. They're defending uh, their seats and trying to pick up one or two others. And they, even if Trump does not win Minnesota, he is likely to win in a majority of the state Senate seats because of the dispersion of the vote. So I. I think we're going to hold on to the state Senate. The House is, of course, much more difficult. Justin, do you, do you agree that the Republicans have, a, have are likely to hold on to the, the state Senate? I think the, I think Democrats win the state Senate. We've got uh, basically playing defense again here in a couple of districts. Matt Little's district, which Trump won by 10, and Matt won the same year. To your point of, is it all uh, kind of top-down good candidates can make a difference in districts? Uh, and, and then the Dan Sparks race are the kind of the two that, that we're tracking on, on, on defense and then the Anderson seat in 44 and the Dan Hill seat and, uh, and then the St. Cloud and Rochester seats. I think there's opportunities for pickups for Democrats. So you see a path to a Democratic yeah. majority. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you, uh, we're almost out of time. Just very quickly, a lot of people are just, just at a wit's end about what to look for in election night. There's going to be lots of you know numbers flying up on the board. If you had just one or two things to track on election night to know how things are going, Justin, what would you recommend in terms of, you know, here's the thing to look for. It'll give you a kind of a leading indicator, not a guarantee, but an indicator. Yeah, first half of the night, I'd look to North Carolina and Florida, two states where the early vote is able to be released shortly after the polls close. If Vice President Biden is, you know, we might have 50, 60 percent of the vote in after uh, when polls close. If Vice President Biden is winning in both those states, it's next to impossible uh, for uh, for the president to uh, to carry the day. Great, Vin. And that's pretty much true. Um, uh, the only caveat I put on it is Florida is a little harder to make an early judgment about because the most Republican area of the state, the Panhandle, is in the Central Time Zone. Uh, so it's a little harder to make an early call on Florida, but I, I think that 
that Justin is basically right. North Carolina and Florida are going to tell us an awful lot. Pennsylvania should too, but they seem to have trouble counting in Pennsylvania. So we may not know as soon as we would like to know in Pennsylvania. I want to thank you two very much. Uh, we're going to be back here in um, a week from tomorrow, talk about how the election uh, worked out. Um, so I want to thank you both, Vin Weber and, and Justin Bowen. Thank you very much. It was great having you. Terrific conversation. And thanks to all of you. Amazing number of high quality questions. I got to many, but obviously not all. Thank you.